Rahman IS. Today we are going to have the Hindu newspaper analysis dated 9th of July 2022. So let us quickly see those articles that are important from the newspaper today. So these are the articles that I have listed that are important for the day. The article number one, it says beating the heat. So this was an editorial page today. Yesterday also there was an uh, there was an article similar to this in the front page, like page number one. Okay, so this page talks about I mean like you know uh, the changing seasonality in Indian subcontinent and around the world. So it talks about heat waves. Okay, heat waves are leading to huge number of people getting killed every year, right in India. And uh, the temperature is varying on our season to season. So we are going to understand about this thing. And uh, there was a study conducted by Center for Science and Environment. So we will understand about that study. And we will also understand about the statistics that were presented by the IMD. IMD stands for India Meteorological Department. Okay. So this topic is important from the viewpoint of environment and ecology. This is important for the prelims exam and also for the mains exam. Uh, apart from this, the second topic, it says a plan that is much more than just planting trees. Okay. So here we are going to understand about, I mean like, you know, the drive that, you know, helps people to plant more trees. So we know that like World Environment Day is celebrated every year on 5th of July. Okay. So this year also it was planted and the author has conducted a thorough study on like, you know, how the World Environment Day is being celebrated and also he talks about you know different government schemes that are in place to boost forestation, to boost afforestation okay and to reduce you know denudation or deforestation. So we are going to learn about all the government schemes that are in place related to you know afforestation and we are also going to talk about like how afforestation helps in mitigating the global climate risk. This topic is related to environment and ecology. It is a part of GS paper 3. Apart from this, we are going to learn the third topic. It says differences over Russia dominate G20 meeting. Okay, so recently there was a meeting of group of 20 countries and this meeting was among the foreign ministers of these 20 industrialized nations and in this meeting I mean like you know there was wide differences in the opinions of different countries related to Russia's war on Ukraine okay so we are going to learn about the recent updates related to the G20 meeting okay so this meeting was held in Bali Indonesia so we are going to discuss about it in detail it is a part of international relations and it is important for GS paper 2 of the mains exam Apart from this, we are going to talk about the next topic. It says defense exports touch rupees 13,000 crore official. So one of the official from the government, okay, he has highlighted that, that the defense exports, the exports that India is making in defense sector, it has touched an all time high of 13,000 crore rupees. Okay. So this, you know, helps us to get an insight how the defense industry is performing in India. So earlier we were a major importer of defense equipments, defense raw material and defense products. But slowly and gradually India is also joining the club of those select nations that are into the exporting, okay, exporting of different, I mean like, you know, defense related goods, okay. So we are going to talk about this and in this article they have also talked about the importance of artificial intelligence in defense and they have also mentioned that like, you know, 75 uh, different artificial intelligence related goods are uh, soon going to be unveiled, soon going to be released. Okay, so this topic is important under science and technology uh, for GS paper 3 and also important under Indian economy for GS paper 3 of mains exam. Apart from this, we are going to look into another topic. It says KHADC to invite talks on instrument of accession. Okay. So we are going to talk about the instrument of accession of Meghalaya. Okay. So earlier Meghalaya was not a part of India. So Meghalaya was added as a part of India. Okay. Uh, during independence. So we are going to learn about it. Okay. So we are going to talk about the instrument of accession. Okay. The document that was signed between the then governor general of India. Okay. Uh, for the instrument of accession. And we are going to talk about, you know, 
those groups like you know Garo, Khasi and Jayantia. Okay, we are going to talk about Meghalaya in detail in this article and we are going to talk about the importance of reading the instrument of accession again. Okay, so these are the topics that I have listed for the day and the last topic is important for Indian polity perspective. Okay, so let us uh, look into these uh, articles one by one. So the first article is related to beating the heat. Okay, so this article talks about heat waves and this article also highlights about you know growing anomalies in the temperature in various seasons. It is generally expected that the temperature will be highest in the summer season, it will be lower in the monsoon season and it will be still lower in the winter season. But uh, like you know when the Center for Science and Environment has conducted a thorough study on this uh, aspect they have identified that the temperature is higher in the monsoon season than in summer or winter seasons okay so monsoon season temperature is much higher than the summer season and like uh, uh, so this you know highlights the anomaly this highlights the uh, contradiction in the changing pattern of temperature in indian subcontinent and the center for science and environment has also identified that the northern region of India, like you know, if you talk about Delhi, Haryana, Punjab, so these regions have much higher temperature as compared to any other region in India. And apart from this, they have also conducted a study to understand about what is the fatality. Fatality means what is the rate of mortality, how many people are dying because of heat waves, okay. So in that study, they have identified that like, you know, out of the total death in the southern region, uh, only Tamil Nadu has recorded, you know, uh, Tamil Nadu has recorded around half of the, okay, Andhra Pradesh, sorry, and Andhra Pradesh has recorded around half of the total death that has happened, okay, because of heat waves. So, we are going to understand about this thing in this article, okay. So, this article talks about a steady rise in the planet's temperature, okay. So, the temperature of the entire planet is continuously rising temperature of the entire planet is continuously rising and it is a consequence of humanity's unfettered use of fossil fuel forms okay so means like you know people are using fossil fuel in an unprecedented level and it, uh, this has you know led to a huge rise in the global average temperature okay so india too has been registering instances of anomalous weather with alarming frequency with an erratic monsoon and coastal erosion okay so apart from this like you know here they have pointed out they have pointed out the study of the india meteorological department also so imd has said that india's average temperature has risen 0 0.62 degree centigrade from 1901 to 2020 but this cse analysis says supporting similar studies on these lines that this has not meant a uniform rise in temperature across seasons okay so the thing is there is no uniform rise in temperature across seasons so the tire temperature is rising haphazardly sometimes it is rising more sometimes it is rising less okay but like we are seeing a uniform trend that there is a you know uh, like unidirectional trend that the temperature is ri rising okay so this is the thing apart from this it is the winter like january and february and post monsoon October to December average all India temperature that have risen faster even the monsoon and summer temperatures okay so winter temperature and post monsoon temperatures have risen faster okay than the like you know normal what we say monsoon and summer temperature okay the average daily minimum temperature showed an even larger 4.9 degree centigrade okay so if we talk about daily temperature increase so 4.9 degree centigrade was the you know rise in temperature so it is a very stark situation now we need to ponder about why the temperature is rising and like what can be done so that you know the rise in temperature can be controlled okay so the shattering of temperature records is only one part of the changes there is also evidence of toll on lives toll on lives means the number of people who are dying because of heat waves because of rising temperature okay so from 2015 to 20 2137 people had reportedly died due to heat stroke in northwest india but southern india had reported 2444 deaths due to excess environmental heat with andhra pradesh accounting for over half of the reported casualties okay in southern india 
2,440 people died, 44 people died and more than half of the death is recorded only in Andhra Pradesh. So this is because of urban heat island effect. So let us understand what do we mean by urban heat island. Okay. So what happens, let's consider this is the entire area, this is the entire region. Okay. The entire region, uh, uh, you know, consists of all the different kinds of landscapes. But let's say like there is one particular region like this and it is an urban area. It is an urban area. So what will happen in this urban area? This urban area has huge number of structures in place. Roads are concrete, okay, buildings are concrete, okay. So like whatever temperature is falling over here, so these temperatures are get, uh, getting trapped, okay. So the thing is there is naturally, I mean the urban area is naturally getting heated up. And at the same time, if rainfall is happening, that rainfall is not able to percolate, you know, into the ground level as efficiently as it, it is able to percolate in the uh, nearby regions, which is, which is not concreted, okay. So this is also leading to urban island effect. So ground water level is going down, okay, means like uh, coming up. It means like, you know, ground water is getting depleted. Okay, water is not able to percolate, the temperature is increasing, okay, and at the same time the tree plantation is not happening in these regions. I mean like, you know, we find much lesser number of trees in the urban region. So this is leading to a situation that is uh, scientifically known as urban heat island. Urban heat island means in the urban areas it becomes an island kind of situation. Island means like which is very different from the neighboring or nearby area. So uh, neighboring areas have a different temperature altogether. But this urban area becomes uh, like you know heat island kind of thing. So its temperature is much higher. So that is known as urban heat island. So let us understand the definition of urban heat island. So it says the urban heat island effect. Okay, Whereby cities because of concrete surfaces and dense population tend, uh, tend, uh, tend to on average be hotter than rural habitations okay so urban areas that has concrete surfaces that has more population these are hotter these are more hot as compared to rural habitations and it also contributed to heat stress okay it contributed to heat stress so indian authorities are cognizant of these trends with some states led by gujarat having heat action plans okay there are many states in India that have uh, their own heat action plans. Means like, you know, if the heat increases um, in urban regions, so like, you know, they will have a plan to carry out. Like, uh, they will have some of the actions that they will be taking. So that like, you know, death toll can be reduced. Okay, so they may distribute water, uh, you know, to people. So they may install uh, like, you know, drinking water facilities like uh, along the roads. They may also like pour water, I mean like on the road. So like, you know, multiple actions can be taken. That is part of heat action plans, okay. So many states in India, including Gujarat, they have heat action plans. Apart from this, like we have National Disaster Management Authority. In short, it is known as NDMA. So National Disaster Management Authority is working with 23 out of 28 heat prone states to develop HAPs. HAPs means heat action plan. So National Disaster Management Authority is working with 23 states. We have 28 states now, but like it is working with 23 states to develop heat action plans. Okay. That uh, uh, like, you know, that stress changes in the built environment using material that keeps the indoors, uh, indoors cooler having an early warning system about heat waves and improving heat infrastructure to treat heat stroke patients. Okay. However, much remains in terms of reaching out to rural India as well as governments taking steps to plan infrastructure and housing in ways that recognize the dangers from a warming environment. Okay. So now this, uh, this helps us in, in understanding about the concept of urban heat island Apart from this, we also understand about like heat action plans are in place in multiple states. The National Disaster Management Authority is also taking a step so that like, you know, more and more number of states adopt heat action plans. And now the construction activities are also molded in such a manner so that like, you know, in urban areas also, the heating effect can be lowered effectively. Okay. And there can be, you know, fast response for people who can have heat strokes and all. 
So these are the, I mean like, you know, multiple, uh, what we say, uh, things associated with the first topic. Now let us talk about the next topic. This topic is also equally important. Why this is important, let us understand. It says a plant that is much more than just planting trees, okay. So here the author is talking about a plant, okay. It is talking about a plant which is much more than, okay, much more than like this particular plant is uh, having more value, having more potential, having more, I mean like, you know, uh, more, what we say, it has more potential to deliver, okay, than just planting trees. So the author is saying that the focus now is on forest landscape restoration to regain ecological functionality and improve human welfare, okay. Now if we talk about, you know, uh, planting trees, so many a times when people are planting trees, the plantation of trees are not scientifically driven. I mean like, you know, they have hazardly uh, try to plant trees anywhere and everywhere. So that, uh, that leads to, I mean like, you know, many of those plants, small plants getting killed. I mean like getting killed in the sense, these plants may not be able to survive because of, you know, different landscapes, like, you know, harsh conditions over there. But the author is talking about, you know, proper scientific measures. So that like before we start plantation, we should understand about the landscape, you know, the nature of trees, the nature of plant uh, plantation that can be planted in those roads. Okay, so here the author is talking about that we should go for landscape restoration. Landscape restoration means, okay, forest landscape restoration means those areas that were earlier forested or those areas that are forested. So like we want to restore the landscape there. We want to create more forested areas even in urban, uh, you know, uh, localities. So like, you know, we also have Nagar One scheme in India. You know, we have a scheme that is known as Nagar. Nagar means city. Okay, Nagar one scheme. One means tree. Okay, one means forest. Nagar forest scheme means like city forest scheme. So, we have Nagar one scheme also. So, the author is talking about the existing government schemes that are in place for restoration of urban, uh, you know, uh, forest landscapes. So here in this article, uh, the author is, you know, highlighting about the fact that like, you know, about 100 women that were employed under Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. So this is known as MG Narega. So these women, I mean, like who were part of MG Narega scheme, they were working for planting huge number of trees. And not only these women were planting, along with the women, the, I mean like, you know, authorities, the city authorities, for example, district magistrates and also, also the school going kids, they all participated for planting trees, okay, they are pa participated for planting trees on June 5, okay, sorry, it is June 5, okay, so June 5 is the, uh, it is celebrated as the World Environment Day, okay, so the, this particular thing is celebrated as World Environment Day, so on World Environment Day, these women, the, you know, district authorities and also school going kids, they were planting huge number of trees. So it was a tree plantation drive. So it was an example of community effort. The author is saying that this is an example of community effort where the entire community is, I mean, like, you know, working for, for restoring the urban landscape. They are, you know, going for plantation drives. They are planting the trees. And so let us move to this month. Uh, it is also time for one Mahotsav. Okay, so they are, uh, the author is saying that this month means July month. This is also a time for one Mahotsav, which literally means celebrate the forest. Okay, so we are now going for celebrating the forest. So the author is also taking us, us back to the history of one Mahotsav. So it says the history of one Mahotsav day goes back to July 1947. When it was first organized by Punjabi botanist, his name is M.S. Randhava. Okay, so Punjabi botanist M.S. Randhava, he first organized the One Mahotsav Day. And subsequently, means after that, in 1950, Kanehiya Lal, Manek Lal Munshi, okay, he was an environmentalist and union minister of agriculture and food, expanded its reach and national scope. Okay, so like, you know, initially it was started in Punjab, 
but later on it has had national scope okay so that's how you know the one mahotsav came into came into being in today's world forest need to be celebrated more than ever okay so now we need to celebrate the forest simultaneously more forest need to be created and restored however there is much debate about the efforts around tree planting is there a right way to do it now the author is saying like do we have any right way to plant the trees the author says yes what is the right way we should go for forest landscape restoration okay so we need to restore the forest landscapes those places that were earlier forest so we need to plant more trees in those areas okay so according to the international union for conservation of nature this is in short known as iucn according to this particular organization deforestation and forest degradation contribute around 12% of global greenhouse gas emission okay so degradation and so forest degradation and uh, this uh, deforestation and forest degradation they contribute about 12% of global greenhouse emission so if we are cutting trees if we are cutting forest so it is leading to more global warming effect so they are saying that deforestation and forest degradation it is increasing the uh, global warming by 12% okay so the total area occupied by primary forest in in india has decreased by 3.6% so if we talk about primary forest cover it has decreased by 3.6% so now we should aim for forest landscape restoration okay so this is a scientific approach okay uh, so what what should be the aim now the author says typically the governments have relied on afforestation and reforestation as a means of establishing trees on non treed land these strategies have now evolved the focus is now on forest landscape restoration the process of regaining ecological functionality and improving human welfare across deforested or degraded forest landscapes okay so now the author is saying like when we are going for forest landscape restoration we are not only you know like rebalancing or we are not only going for you know a vitality of the forest cover like you know so we are also trying to uh, you know improve the ecological functionality and we are trying to improve the human welfare because when environment is safe humans are also safe when environment is not safe it has you know repercussions for human well being as well so with this let us you know learn little more on this topic so the author says that a crucial aspect of this process this process means forest landscape restoration process so a crucial aspect of this process is to ensure the diversity of the species while planting trees okay so whenever we are planting trees we should you know go for diversity of the species i mean like we should not plant single type of trees over a la larger area we should plant multiple type of trees okay we should have species variety tree variety in planting uh, in going for forest landscape restoration natural forest with diverse native tree species are more efficient in sequestering carbon than monoculture trees plantation so here the author is saying whenever we have a natural forest in natural forest we have you know diversities of trees in one area right but like if we go for monoculture pl plantation we will having we will be having only single type of trees over a uh, larger land landscape but like when we talk about carbon sequestration okay when we talk about carbon sink it happens more in natural forest because there is diversity of trees it happens le uh, less in in monoculture trees okay so so the author is highlighting the fact of tree diversity okay carbon sequestration means it means like you know carbon is getting sink okay carbon is getting utilized carbon dioxide is getting utilized so when carbon dioxide is getting utilized by the trees so what happens naturally naturally uh, the i mean like you know amount of carbon dioxide in the environment reduces okay so like we have lesser global warming effect because more carbon dioxide is getting utilized by the plants planting diverse species is also healthier for local communities and their livelihood and international study that was published earlier this year in the journal science okay found that 
diversifying species in forest plantation has a positive impact on the quality of the forest okay so when we talk about improving the quality of forest we should go for you know diversifying the tree species in that forest okay so this was a article that was uh, the, uh, you know uh, published in the journal science okay there is a journal its name is science so it was published there and in punjab for instance the community is proactively planting native species such as jhand okay uh, prospis cineraria this is the scientific name of this particular you know tree desi kicker which is acacia nilotica okay and farva its name is tamarix aphyla okay so these are scientific names that are written in uh, like you know under the bracket which are resilient and acclimatized okay and most of these saplings have a high survival rate of 90% a vital requirement for sustainable reforestation activities apart from this like if we talk about planting trees it has a pivotal role pivotal role it means it has a central role okay in afforestation process in forest landscape restoration process so the author is saying that tree planting comes with varied environmental and ecological benefits so whenever we are planting trees it has environmental benefit it has ecological benefit as well forests are integral in regulating ecosystems influencing the carbon cycle and mitigating the effects of climate change okay so it has the potential of mitigating the effect of climate change and at the same time uh, it plays role in regulating the ecosystem influencing the carbon cycle so annually forest absorb roughly 2.6 billion tons okay how much 2.6 billion tons of carbon dioxide this absorption includes nearly 33% of carbon dioxide released from burning fossil fuels for example if we are burning fossil fuels out of uh, the total uh, you know fossil fuels that we are burning 33% of the fossil fuels carbon dioxide is getting utilized by the plants only okay so the plants are you know playing major role in carbon sequestration but beyond the environmental benefits there is human dimension that is at front and center millions of lives and livelihoods are interwined with our forest forests are a boon for local communities and their livelihoods by functioning as a resource base for goods and services and india is an agrarian economy agrarian means largely majority of indian population are dependent on agricultural practices for their livelihood that's why we are saying india is a agrarian majorly agrarian economy okay according to academics from world resources institute okay from world resources institute forest ecosystems enrich soil fertility water availability enhancing agricultural productivity and in turn in the rural economy okay so like you know forest ecosystems they enrich soil fertility water availability enhancing agricultural productivity and so it boosts the rural economy okay so tree planting prevents erosion okay so these are the benefits i am reading out so that you understand about the benefits of tree plantation okay so tree planting prevents erosion and stems flooding sustainable forest crops reduce food insecurity and empower women allowing them to gain access to more nutritional diets and new income streams okay agroforestry lessens rural to urban migration and contributes to an increase in resources and household income planting trees is deeply linked to the holistic well-being of all individuals the community and the planet okay so when we are planting trees it helps in the rural economy it not only helps the rural economy but it also helps the planet at large okay because the planet uh, planet gets benefited okay so apart from this <coughs> let us understand little more so india and programs so what are the government schemes that are in place for afforestation for uh, i mean plantation related drives okay so this span 2021 to 30 is the un decade on ecosystem restoration you can utilize this point in writing a means answer okay it says this span i mean the time period from 2021 to 2030 it is un decade on ecosystem restoration so we are in the un decade for ecosystem restoration emphasizing efforts to restore degraded 
industrial ecosystems including forest in 2011 the bond challenge was launched okay in 2011 bond challenge was launched with a global goal to restore 150 million hectares of degraded and deforested landscape by 2020 and 350 million hectares by 2030 india joined the bond challenge in 2015 pledging to restore 26 million hectares of degraded and deforested land by 2030 okay so india has also joined the bond challenge this is a very important bond challenge is associated with restoration of forested lands or like you know to go for i mean like you know or restoration of degraded and deforested land so india has joined in 2015 and it is going to do the thing by the year of 2030 there are a myriad government programs such as compensatory afforestation the national afforestation program the national mission for a green india which is also known as green india mission then we have the nagar van scheme and the forest fire prevention and management scheme okay to name a few so these are the programs that are in place now this article is very important this article is helping you to summarize the entire you know uh, like ecosystem around forest reforestation okay reforestation or reducing the deforestation right so green skill development program we have uh, you know telangaku haritha haram okay so these are multiple you know initiatives that is there in in various places this particular program belongs to telangana okay apart from this planting a sapling so when we talk about planting a sapling so what is the right way to undertake tree plantation drive to be successful forest landscape restoration must be implemented proactively bolstering landscapes and forest ecosystem to be durable and adjustable in the face of future challenges and social, uh, societal needs it also needs the involvement and alignment of host of stakeholders in, including community champion uh, like you know champions government and land owners the rest uh, the restoration of natural forest ecosystem can be strengthened through participatory governance by engaging stakeholders as in punjab example okay so the author is highlighting about the importance of forest landscape restoration in this article now with this let us take another article this is article number 3 so we are going to discuss about this ir issue ir means international relations issue okay so this is related to gs paper 2 of the mains exam so let us understand about differences over russia dominate uh, g20 meeting okay so we are going to understand about this so what has happened recently a g20 meeting has happened where the foreign ministers of the 20 industrialized nations have participated foreign ministers of the group of 20 like you know group of 20 is an international grouping so the foreign ministers of these countries have participated but in this meeting what has happened the differences over russia means like you know russia has launched a war on ukraine but like every country has a different standpoint some of the western countries for example the us canada and many other countries they have sidelined russia and and they have uh, you know they are making a block that is against russia related to you know ukraine war and apart from this there are many other countries that are still i mean like you know uh, susceptible like you know they are trying to balance up uh, the view points of different countries and they uh, they are trying to be neutral in this situation so external affairs minister s jay shankar on friday met with us secretary of state okay so now let us understand that g20 meeting has happened in bali okay so this was a foreign ministers meeting the meeting indicated the emerging differences within the g20 grouping as russia accused the united states of forcing europe and the rest of the world to abandon cheap energy sources while the us blamed moscow for global food insecurity okay the united states of america has blamed moscow moscow means russia that moscow is responsible for global food insecurity now okay so this is the thing now in this particular conversation what has happened 
the Indian External Affairs Minister, Mr. S. Jay Shankar, was also present there. And Mr. S. Jay Shankar, I mean, like you know, he has uh, he has mentioned in this particular meeting that, like you know, the India is trying to India is trying to balance uh, the uh, what we say balance. Between US and Russia means like you know it has a stand which is neutral. Neutral in the sense it wants to maintain good and healthy relation with these two countries. Although they may be having you know differences among themselves. Okay. So here what has uh, Mr. Jay Shankar said? He has said the continued the conversation. Uh, he has said our relationships today allow us to approach a range of challenges with a greater understanding and openness. Okay. So different ministers have said different things related to it. Okay. So the G20, as many as 20 of the world's biggest economic powers such as US, Russia, European Union, India, Indonesia and Japan has a mandate to discuss global economic matters. But the foreign ministers meeting in Bali was dominated by criticism of Russians by the Western members. Okay. So these are the things. Now, apart from this, like, you know, they have also mentioned in this article that, like, you know, there are many countries that have, you know, formed a block. The Ukrainian war and its economic fallouts are hinting at a division within the ranks of the global grouping with US, United, uh, like, United States, European Union, Japan, Canada, Australia and France forming an anti-Russian, uh, Russia block. Okay, they have formed an anti-Russia block. Then, so multiple things has happened. Now, this is just a discussion. I mean, this is this was just a discussion or participation of G20 group of countries in Bali. So they discussed about their own national interest. But this particular meeting was, I mean, like dominated by the differences over Russia's, you know, uh, like Russia's war on Ukraine. So with this, uh, let us take another topic, which is topic number four for the day. We are going to discuss in detail about this topic. It says defense exports touch 13,000 crore. Okay, so this was said by an official of the Ministry of Defense. That official is a secretary to the Ministry of Defense. Okay, secretary or additional secretary means like uh, essentially like he may be an IS officer. Okay, so this was the statement by that officer. So uh, the officer said that 75 artificial intelligence products having applications in the sector will be launched it was said by the defense ministry okay so india's defense exports for 2021 22 were estimated at 13000 crore rupees and it was the highest ever okay it was said by the additional secretary in the defense ministry and the us united states was a major buyer as also nations in the southeast asia west asia and africa so now here this particular article helps us to understand that like India's position in terms of you know export and defense equipments is uh, increasing okay it is increasing year on year why because like we are now exporting more and this year 2021 to 22 financial year we had the highest ever defense exports okay the importing countries included the United States, West Asian countries, African countries and South, uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. Okay. So the private sector accounted for 70% of the exports. Okay. So the, while the public sector farms accounted for the rest. Okay. So majority of the exports were done by the private sector itself. Okay. Earlier the private sector used to account for 90% but now the share of defense public sector units had gone up okay now the public sector is i mean like you know playing little more role than before earlier 90 percent was the share of the private sector only 10 percent public sector now public sector is you know contributing to 30 percent of the total defense exports so what was the methodology that they have adopted for accounting uh, this particular figure which is 13,000 crore so uh, you know while explaining this methodology the officer said only components which needed defense authorization were accounted. They were listed under the SCOMAT 6 category. Okay, SCOMAT 6 category. So this is one of the category, uh, you know, where like, you know, those companies, those, those organizations that are importing, uh, that are exporting the goods there that has some defense related things. So, okay. So they have to be categorized under this. So, uh, like, you know, this was uh, accounted, the accounting was done by following this particular criteria, okay. 
and uh, several aviation components and dual use items which did not come under the list were not accounted. Now, here uh, the author is saying that like you know role of the artificial intelligence will have more bearing on defense sector as well. Artificial intelligence is going to play major role okay it is going to major uh, play major role in defense equipments and now the officer mentioned that like you know they will inaugurate a symposium and exhibition on artificial intelligence and in defense organized by the Def department of defense production apart from this talking to pros uh, you know press persons defense secretary he said that 75 newly developed artificial intelligence products and technologies having applications in defense would be launched. Nature of modern warfare is changing and AI will play significant role in all forms of modern warfare. So they are saying that the nature of modern warfare, the way how countries you know, fight wars is changing and so artificial intelligence is going to play bigger role, greater role in this uh, Thing. and they are going to I mean like you know uh, launch 75 newly developed artificial intelligence products okay so this is the thing I mean like this is the core of this discussion so now it highlights that artificial intelligence or machine learning will be a part of uh, this uh, what we say defense uh, you know industry and the uh, public sector undertakings are also playing major role in this particular sector so with this uh, like we will take another topic this topic is very important it is important for gs paper 2 okay of the mains exam so let us discuss about this topic it says khadc to invite talks on instrument of accession so we are going to learn about instrument of accession we are going to learn about khadc what is the full full form of khadc khadc stands for Khasi Hills Autonomous Districts Council okay KHADC stands for Khasi Hills Autonomous District Councils okay so this Khasi Hills Autonomous Districts Council members they have together agreed that they are going to revisit the instrument of accession so what is this instrument of accession okay so this particular instrument of accession I mean like it was signed okay seven decades ago it was signed seven decades ago okay so seven decades ago means 70 years ago and so like you know in this uh, so what has happened the instrument of accession that made Khasi domain a part of Indian Union it was signed seven decades ago Meghalaya is divided into three region dominated by uh, by as many as uh, met, uh, as many matrilineal communities okay in Meghalaya we have matrilineal communities what do we mean by matrilineal communities means the head of the house head of the house is women okay there like you know like India is considered to be a uh, like patriarchal society where like you know father mindset prevails over the household but when we talk about matrilineal society means like those societies where women are the heads of the houses okay so what has happened like Meghalaya has a matrilineal society and they have you know I mean three regions in Meghalaya that are dominated by three matrilineal communities these are the Khasis, the Garos and the Jayantiyas okay the Khasi hill is uh, 25 Himalayas or states that form the federation of Khasi states okay so now the Khasi hills autonomous district council which stands for KHADC agreed that the instrument of accession and an annexed agreement signed with the dominion of India between December 15, 1947 and March 1948 should be studied. The treaty was signed by Governor General of India and he was C. Raja Gopalachari. C means Chakravarti Raja Gopalachari on August 17, 1948. So this particular instrument of accession was signed in 1948, August 17, 1948. Understanding the paragraphs of the agreement is important as many provisions are missing from the sixth schedule of the constitution. Okay, so they are saying that when we read the sixth schedule of the constitution where the provisions of this particular, you know, annexation agreement or, or the instrument of accession is mentioned. 
okay some of the provisions are missing in the six schedule so they want to revisit that particular thing and if they in future if they find that some of the provisions are not included in the six schedule so they may i mean like you know request the central government or agitate against this particular thing and get these things included okay so this may be one of the viewpoint of the khasi hills autonomous district council so this is a very important topic it talks about the sixth schedule of the constitution of india so you need to read the fifth schedule you need to read the sixth schedule of the constitution of india you will understand about autonomous district councils like the role played by autonomous district council okay in meghalaya we have it in assam we have it in many northeastern states we have autonomous district councils so we need to read about it to learn more on this particular you know subject or topic so that's all uh, for the discussion today thank you so much everyone for attending today's session and i hope you have a good day ahead thank you welcome to lukman ias study general studies with lukman ias for building comprehensive knowledge gs paper 2 and 4 will be taken by s ansari and other papers will be covered by renowned faculties Live classes are as effective as offline classes. The classes are highly interactive in nature. Your doubts and queries will be addressed and there will be dictation of notes. In the last 10 years, Lukman IS has set up a niche in the field of UPSC guidance.